Well, good morning. Hey, how many of you would just be honest this morning and say, I'm kind of glad 2015 is gone, right? You know, for some, it's been, a, it's been a rough year. There's For some, they've experienced death, they've experienced pain, they've experienced loss, you know, so it's not necessarily uh, all these great memories, and so sometimes it's, it's good to just kind of wave the year goodbye, but, uh, but we look forward to a new year with such expectation. I love the new year. I love this time of year. I love it. For me, it's such a time of reflection and a time of, of looking forward. I'm, I guess I'm an optimist. I've been accused of that before. But I, I just think that there's so much to look forward to. And uh, there's a passage of Scripture that I want to use this morning just kind of to launch out our discussion. And on, the, on your seat somewhere around you, there's a card that says the one on the front and on the back it says my one. And over the next three weeks, we're going to be using these cards and we're going to be doing something with these cards. But if you'll kind of take that card and, and hold it because there's going to be something you'll be doing with it later on and look for a pen that works. Sometimes those pens in the chair, they've been sitting for a while. But, uh, and we're going to need to do something with this card in just a little bit. But there's a passage of scripture I want to read that is, is so powerful. It's just a great passage for this time of year. And it's Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. And God said this, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. In other words, let go of some things that have been holding you back. Don't dwell on the former things. Don't dwell on the things of the past. God says, see, I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing. Everybody say, new thing. I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing, God says, and now it springs up. Don't you perceive it? God says, God says, I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Can't you see I'm doing something new? We like new things, don't we? Right? I mean, we just got a bunch of new things under the Christmas tree. You open those presents, they were new. Now, Kaylin tried a little trick this Christmas because uh, there's a pair of shoes that I guess she got me. And, uh, and I just don't wear them that often. They feel kind of uncomfortable on my feet, you know. So she tried wrapping those shoes up and putting them as Christmas, you know, so that's what I got from her for Christmas. It wasn't as exciting the second time around, I'll just be honest with you. They had like dirt on the sole. I mean, they were just like, what? What's this? I'm glad she didn't find any of my underwear and try to re-gift those, you know. <laughs> but we don't like things that are used. We don't like stuff that's been, you know, I mean, we like new things, right? Now, if you grew up in a big family and you know, maybe there was this hand-me-down thing that you experienced. I was number four of four boys. I was the last one. I was number five of six kids. And I got all kinds of hand-me-downs. I don't remember ever getting an original pair of uh, pants or, or shoes until I was older, you know, in life. And um, so I like new things. I don't care for hand-me-downs. I kind of had my time with the hand-me-down thing. So we like new things. God's, you know, he's, he's doing something new. And I believe God wants to speak to us today. He is speaking to us. If we'll listen, if we'll perceive it. And he's saying, I'm, I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing in a new year. And I'm going to do a new thing in your life. If you'll just listen. If you'll perceive it. Now, how many of you have your New Year's resolutions already picked out? Come on. Oh, come on. You know, a little shy. We, we, we think about, what am I going to do, you know, different this year? What am I going to, you know, what am I going to go after? What am I going to change? Now, now, some of you aren't being honest. You got them. You're just, you know, afraid because you don't want to be part of that crowd, right? Because you know what happens. Because by the end of January, 40% of New Year's resolutions, they tank. And by Valentine's Day, 75%. Of those, res, uh, those New Year's resolutions are gone. They're, they're off the wagon. Now, I, I, I'm not totally sure why that happens. But I think there's, there's a reason. I think one of the reasons is we, we have good intentions. But we don't have God intentions. See, good intentions are not always, but usually they're me-centered. You know, they're just kind of, they're, they're kind of me-centered. But God intentions are God-centered. And so instead of just having good intentions this year, 
it's my prayer that in this service, we'll just listen to the Holy Spirit. You know that the Bible says that as a Christian, as a believer, as a follower of Christ, you and I, God's presence lives in us. He lives in us. And he's constantly communicating with you. He wants to speak to you today. He wants you to hear him. And he wants to drop something into your heart. That one thing. Because sometimes when it comes to resolutions, sometimes when it comes to our life, we have so many things we're pulling from. And the list is so large, it's so extensive, that we end up doing nothing. But I believe that God, if you listen to him this morning, that the Holy Spirit will drop something into your heart. And instead of ten things, just one thing. One thing that God wants to do for you, one thing he wants to do in you, one thing he wants from you in this new year. And I I believe God's going to show you that one thing. And so that's why it's important for this card. And so by the end of the service, you may be, as I'm talking, you may say, that's it, that's the one thing. Boom, it just drops into your heart. But maybe it's going to be at the end of the service. But we're going to write something down. That one thing that we want from God or we want God to do in us. See, when God births something in you, it will come to pass. You see, God says, I'm doing a new thing. So I'm going to ask you four questions this morning to kind of stir up the pot, to kind of get you thinking about that one thing, all right? So let's start with one of the questions. The first one thing question is, what one thing do you desire from God above everything else? What one thing do you desire from God above everything else? What is it? What, what's that one thing you desire from God? So you, you may be at a place in your life where you say, you know, there's this person at work or there's this person at school or this, this, this person at school. There's this person that, that I know that they don't know Christ. They're not in a relationship with Christ. And man, I, I really want to be an instrument, a tool. I want to be able to bring them to life. I want to be used by God in their lives. Maybe that's your one thing. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's, you say this morning, you know, my marriage isn't where God wants it to be. Can we pause for just a second? And just let the Holy Spirit speak to people. You might, you might be saying, you know, my marriage is not where God wants it to be. And there's one thing that I desire from God, and that's healing in my marriage. And you're thinking, how can this happen? If God would just fix that person that I'm married to, right? He's so stubborn. She's so stubborn. You know, if God would just fix them. But maybe the one thing that God wants to do is change your heart. So he can heal your marriage. Maybe. Maybe that's your one thing. Maybe you've been promising for a long time. Okay, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to slow down. Years have gone by and, and, and you're just missing out on life. And, uh, and maybe your one thing is, is I, need to just, I need to just enjoy life. I need to slow down. I need to live life according to the rhythms of God's grace and not according to the patterns of this world. Maybe that's something you just need to hold on to right there, that, that I need to live life according to the rhythms of God's grace, not according to the patterns of this world. And I just need to slow down. Maybe that's your one thing. What one thing would you have God do in your life? Maybe it's a new job, a career change. Maybe it's a, a child that you've been wanting. Some of you who are not married, maybe it's that person you, you want somebody, you want to be able to spend the rest of your life with someone. You want to be married. Maybe that's your one thing. Maybe it's a relationship restored. Maybe it's healing in your body, in your mind, in your heart. Freedom from something. How about getting out of debt? Especially after Christmas. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's getting out of debt. Maybe it's living healthy. What's that one thing that you would have God do in your life. King David, before he was king, right, even after, well, after he was king, David was referred to as a man after God's own heart. Even 
even after David sinned terribly with Bathsheba and all that story, you know, we heard a little bit about that over the last couple weeks. Even with all that, God says, David was a man after my own heart. And maybe the reason that he was a man after God's own heart was because he desired one thing. And this is what he desired in Psalm 27, verse 4 through 5. It says, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. So if I could have one thing, he says, this is what David says, I want to be with God. It's not, it's not that he just wanted to go to church. You get that, right? It's one thing, if I could have just one thing, I want to be with God. I want his presence in my life. I need his goodness in my life. I need to know that he's with me always. If there's one thing that I need in the good times, it's God. If there's one thing I need in the bad times, it's God. If there's one thing that I desire above everything else, it's to dwell, to live with the presence of God. This is what David wanted. And that's why God speaks, when God speaks of him, he says, this is a man after my own heart. This is, he wanted my presence. He wanted to be with me. There's you know, several years ago, I learned something. I don't know when it happened in my life, but I learned something because all my life, I was kind of taught when it comes to prayer is you just go to God and you ask him for things. That's what prayer is, right? Prayer is asking God for stuff. And, and so I learned something a few, uh, several years ago that instead of, instead of seeking and pursuing the hand of God, I pursued God's heart. So instead of looking for his hand, instead of pursuing his hand or his handouts, right? Because that's kind of what a lot of people, it's just like, God, I need this, God, I need this, God, I need this. And we're, we're pursuing God's hand. And something changed. And I don't know if it was, maybe I heard it in a message. Maybe I, I don't know, maybe just the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And, but, but, but something changed. And, and I don't look for God's hand anymore. I don't look for his handouts. I, I pursue his heart. When I was a youth pastor, I was a youth pastor for 14 years, working with teenagers. And I, I would tell our teenagers, listen, if you, here's the key to, to getting what you want out of your parents. So all of you young people, this is it. I'm about to give you some valuable information. All right, this is worth you getting up early and being at church this morning. So listen up. This is it. If you, if you want to wrap your mom and dad around your finger and your arm and all that, you want to get what you want out of your parents, Here's, here's how you do it. Seek their heart. Pursue their heart. You say, wait, what? What do you mean? Pursue their heart. Let them have your heart. What parent in this world would not give their kids everything if they, if they, if they knew, man, I got my kid's heart. My kid's got my heart. Parents, would you give your kids whatever they want? Come on. Yeah, this is not a loaded question. This is for real. Listen, if, if I know that my kids have got my heart and I know that I've got their heart, and my daughter's always trying to get my wallet anyway, but I would, I'd be like, here, take it all. You want my car, my truck? What do you, you know, what do you want? If I know that they have my heart and I know I've got their heart, man. Something happens inside of us. The same thing goes for God. Psalm 37, 4 says this. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. See, God, he's not wanting to hold back from us. He's not trying to, to play games with you. He wants you to have everything that you desire in your heart. But he says, I want, I want you to pursue my heart. Quit just seeking God for the handouts. Quit just pursuing his hand and what you can get next. Say, man, God, I, I want your heart. What is that one thing you want from the Lord? Maybe the Holy Spirit's dropping something into your heart right now. 
So that's first one thing question. Second one thing question that I want to ask you this morning. As we look for that one thing, here it is. When it comes to your spiritual life, when it comes to your relationship with God, what one thing do you lack? What one thing do you lack? What one thing is missing in your life? So Mark chapter 10 tells a story of a, a rich guy who encountered Jesus. He calls him a rich young ruler. And he's following Jesus along, and, and he, he just says to Jesus one day, he says, Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Those are good questions for Jesus. He loves those questions. And so Jesus said, well, you, you need to obey the commands. And the guy very proudly said, well, check, check, check. You know, yeah, I've, I've done all that stuff. I've done, I've done it since I was young. I've, I've obeyed God's commands, his law. And Jesus looked right through his outward obedience and looked into this man's heart. And see, Jesus saw a problem that this guy didn't even see himself. He said something to this guy that he never said to anybody else. He was the only one. Mark chapter 10. Jesus looked at him. And he did what? He looked at him and he loved him. See, notice he's about to say something that's very difficult. But it was all in love. He looked at him and he loved him. And he said one thing. Not two things, not ten things. One thing you lack. He said, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. What's standing in the way of you completely following Jesus? What is it? What's that one thing that you lack? What's that one thing you need? What's standing in the way of you completely following Jesus? And for this guy, it was, it was material possessions. It was his desire for security, for wealth. And Jesus said, that one thing is in the way. It's getting in the way of you following me, of you completely following me. Now, it doesn't mean, and Jesus didn't say, hey, if you have money, you can't follow me. It's not what he's saying. But there's something in our lives. And God was able to, to look past all that outward stuff. Jesus can see past our our facade and our fakeness that we put up. And he was able to cut right through that and say, there's one thing you're lacking. You're a nice guy. As a matter of fact, I love you. I love you enough that I'm going to tell you what that one thing is. I'm going to say it. And when Jesus said it, it says, the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. See, God showed him that one thing, but he wasn't willing to do the one thing. Maybe the Holy Spirit is going to drop something into your heart this morning and show you that one thing, and it's going to take courage for you to do that one thing, to follow him. You know, our culture is, is kind of, you know, it's interesting where we're at culturally, and um, there's this idea that, you know, you can't really say you love me if you don't agree with everything in my life. That's the, that's the idea out there, which is really kind of stupid. If you really use your brain, please, let's do this. But I think a lot of people don't. If you really think that through, it doesn't even make sense. If you, you know, how can you really say you love me, but you don't agree with all of my lifestyle choices and all of my decisions and all, you know, I think it's interesting that Jesus, it, that this passage says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Because he loved him enough to be honest with him. There are some things that we're lacking. There are some things that we're, we're missing in our lives. And I, I, I love you enough, I'm going to tell you. Maybe not today, but maybe sometime in 2016. We're going to talk about some things. What's that one thing that you're lacking? What is it that's keeping you from, from really following Jesus all the way? I'm not talking about just believing in Jesus, just, just having this idea and this, you know, belief that he existed. But what's keeping you from really following him? I love you enough. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you some of those things. A few weeks ago 
in the, uh, my, my dysfunctional family message series. Uh, I don't even remember what, which message it was, but after service, um, Christine Thomas, I don't know how many of you know Christine Thomas, but she usually sits right there. And, uh, and she, I came down off the stage, and she came right over to me. And I thought, oh, God, what'd I say? You know, like, you know, you know pastors never know. What, is he going to get punched in the face, or is he going to get hugged? Um, never been punched in the face. But anyway, um, and she said, you, you inspired me today. I'm like, well, good. You know, that's what, that's, what I, that's what I hope I do, you know. She said, I'm going home, and I'm, I'm telling Jim we're getting married. So I'm like, Cool. Well, I thought it was just, you know, I get a lot, I'll just be honest with you, I get a lot of emotional, you know, after service, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I didn't know how far that would go, and that evening, I got a text, hey, are you good for New or Christmas Eve? I'm like, yeah, let's do that, you know? So Christmas Eve, we had a wedding here at Vive. You know what's, what's exciting to me, and I'm so proud of, of Christine and Jim, who were in ser- first service this morning, sitting right there is that there was one thing that they were lacking. There was one thing. It, it, wasn't, it didn't mean that we didn't love them. It didn't mean that we looked at them differently. We don't do that. If you, that doesn't exist here. If it does, we, we send you somewhere else. But we, it didn't keep us from loving them. We loved them. But, but something that I said, the Holy Spirit spoke to them and said, that's one thing. And that one thing that we're lacking, we're going to remove. Because we want to follow Jesus as a family. And that, to me, I'm extremely proud. When I see things like that happen, when I see people responding. You know, I've had people, so many people this past year who've come to me and said, you know what, we're going to start tithing. We're going to start giving God 10%, honoring him first. And I know that's a struggle for a lot of people. Maybe you're one of those people that's really struggling with it. But I've had several people that have, have come to me and said, we're going to do that. And, and, and it was a big step. I was talking with Duanna this morning. And uh, some of you know who Duanna is. And just we're talking about the importance of, of being together in fellowship with other believers, being here on Sunday. Now, you know, it's true. You can be a, you can be a Christian and not go to church, okay? Because people ask me all that, preacher, do you? Do you really, do you, have to, do you have to go to church to be a Christian? Do you have to go to church to get to heaven? Well, I don't even know what going to church means because uh, honestly, the Bible doesn't say you have to go to church. It talks about being the church. But this is true. You can't get to heaven and not be the church. You have to be the church to get to heaven. And so coming together and fellowship, and we talked about the importance of that and and and. You know, the stand that she has taken. God's done some amazing things in Duanna's life. Taking her from, from some places, some crazy places. But she is committed. This one thing I'm not budging on. I'm going to be here at church. And she serves faithfully. She honors the Lord. What is it, one thing? What is it that you're lacking? Maybe you're one of those that just kind of comes to church, but you're not sure what it means to be the church. You say, man, I'm not, I'm not quite ready to get that, you know, crazy, radical. Maybe you're just kind of holding back and, and you're kind of stealthy, you know, you're, you're in and out and you've been coming for a while and, and maybe God's saying, you know what, it's time to connect. It's time to, to be the church. Maybe it's reading your Bible. Maybe it's prayer. And having that discipline, it's, maybe it's reaching out, maybe it's serving, whatever it might be. Maybe it's fellowship with other Christians. But what is that one thing that you lack? What is keeping you from really following Jesus? All right, just stirring the pot this morning, all right? Making you think. Got your card? I'm going to write something in just a little while. Here's a third one thing question. What one thing do you need to let go of? What one thing do you need to let go of? What one thing do you continue to grip that holds you back from where God wants you to be? What is it? What's the one thing you need to let go of? 
the Apostle Paul wrote, with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote Philippians chapter, uh, Philippians, the whole book, but Philippians. And, uh, and in, this, in this book of Philippians, this letter to the Philippians, there's a powerful passage of Scripture in Philippians chapter 3. And he's talking about how he wants to know Christ. Not just know about Christ. He doesn't want just more information about Jesus. He wants to know Christ. He wants to really be close to him and know him. And so he says in verse 13, he says, Brothers, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This one thing I'm going to do. I'm forgetting what is behind and I'm straining on towards what is ahead. I'm pressing on. See, I don't know what, what it was that the Apostle Paul, what, what it was that he was needing to let go of. But obviously, he felt and understood that if I'm going to really know Christ, if I want to really know him and be close to him, then I've got to let go of something. Maybe it was the fact that Paul, before he started following Jesus, was there when Stephen, the first martyr, the first Christian martyr, was stoned to death. See, it was Paul who, his name was Saul at that point. He was the one that instigated this. He was the one that, that was there while Stephen was being stoned. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe he had to let go of that guilt, that shame of being responsible for someone's death. Maybe it was the fact that he persecuted the church and he pursued Christians and he had them arrested. Maybe that was it. Maybe that was the thing that he felt like he needed to let go of. Maybe it was the pain that he experienced and the suffering that he experienced after he started following Christ. At the hands of people who were his brothers, his friends, these were all the religious leaders that he hung with. These were his peeps. And now all of a sudden, He's getting it from them. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's the suffering that he experienced. He's whipped five times with 40 lashes. He was, uh, he was shipwrecked three times, beaten three times with rods, stoned and left for dead. Maybe that's what it was. See, some of you are holding on to some things. You're holding on to some things of the past. It's time to let go. Someone hurts you, and you're holding on to it. You got unforgiveness, you got bitterness inside of your heart. And God would say to you this morning, I want to do something new, but you can't dwell on the past. You can't dwell on the past. See, someone hurts you, so you continue to punish them. I think one of the biggest problems in marriages is that we get hurt by the person who is closest to us. And we hold on to it. And somehow we want to punish them back. And we want to hold on to that thing and kind of get back at them. Let go of it. Some of you failed at something. Maybe in 2015 you experienced loss. You experienced failure. And, and you think, because I failed at this, because this didn't happen the way that I thought it would, then therefore I'm a failure. No, it's, it's not. It doesn't determine who you are. That's just something that happened. It's not who you are. What is it that you need to let go of? The fourth question, this is it, the final one. What one promise from God do you need to claim in your life? What one promise from God do you need to claim? And I, my prayer is that this will speak to you in a big way. I waited during the first service for me to just, you know, let the Holy Spirit drop something into my heart for this year. And God spoke a promise into my heart. And maybe he'll speak a promise into your heart. One thing. David, before he was king, grew up in a house with seven boys. He was number seven. I feel his pain. But he was the youngest of seven. And, and uh, when Samuel, the prophet, came to, to anoint a new king of Israel... God spoke to Samuel and said, I want you to go to the house of Jesse. 
and I want you to anoint a new king of Israel. So he gets to Jesse's house in Bethlehem, and Jesse brings out the oldest son. And when Samuel sees him, Samuel the prophet, he sees him, he, he says, oh, man, that's, that's it. He looks like a king. He's tall. He's handsome. He would be a great king. And, and God speaks to the prophet Samuel and says, wrong. You're looking at the outward appearance. See, man looks at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. And so Samuel's like, okay, look, he's not the one. And one by one, no No crownings going on. And so he says to, to uh, Jesse, the dad, he says, hey, do you have any more sons? And he said, well, yeah, yeah, the youngest son, David, he's out tending the sheep. See, Jesse didn't even have the, the confidence that David would be picked. He didn't bother to even send for him the first time. And so they sent for him, had him brought in. As soon as the prophet saw him, he said, that's the new king of Israel. God speak, spoke to him very clearly. And so what they did when they anointed a king of Israel, it wasn't like they just touched him on the shoulders or did the sign of the cross. I mean, they poured oil over them. And so here's David taking an oil bath. Talk about essential oils, right? <laughs> but he's covered in oil. I mean, this is a huge deal because, man, I mean, everybody knew what was going on. His brothers, his dad, all this is like, wow, what? 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 King, God made David a promise that day that you will be the new or the next king of Israel. Well, if you know the story, if you've ever read the story, you, you understand it didn't happen right away. See, when we get a promise from God, we want it to happen right then, huh? I want it now. I'm not leaving here until I get my promise, God. You promised me. Years went by, years went by. David went to live in, in Saul's house, working under the king, the mad king Saul, the crazy king Saul, the some believe was even demon-possessed at some point, went to work with this crazy guy. You, you probably work for him too. Um, just kidding. And so here he is, and he's like, God, you promised me to be king, but here I am living in this crazy man's house, serving the king. And, it, and at one point, it got so bad that David had to flee for his life because Saul was trying to kill him. And it got so bad, he was trying to hide from Saul that he decided, I'm going to flee. I'm going to go to the Philistines. I'm going to go live with the Philistines who are the enemies of Israel, and that way I'll be safe. Well, that was stupid because remember Goliath? He happened to be a Philistine. David wasn't a stranger to the Philistines. And so he wasn't thinking. And so he, here he finds himself between a rock and a hard place. And he's living with the Philistines. And in order to live with the Philistines, he actually had, he, he faked out, faked being a lunatic, a crazy man. And so here's David. Just, you know, whatever it is, you know, crazy people do. Because I'm not a crazy person, right? But I did, I, I had a friend who lived in Miami he grew up there, and he told me about this time that he was at night, and he was traveling, walking somewhere, and he actually had to fake like he was crazy just to get, without getting hurt, and, uh, he, and it worked. So, hey, just, just an idea, you know, the crazy man thing works. It's worked twice that I know of, all right? So here he's acting crazy, and it's not just a one-time show. It's not like he just put on a show one time, and they're like, oh, he's crazy, and then he started acting normal. He lived there for a while. And he had to all the time act crazy. And, and so here he is between a rock and a hard place. He's being pursued by Saul who wants to kill him. He's now having to fake being a crazy person. And after, be, after faking being crazy for a while, you kind of start to become crazy, right? I'm not speaking from experience, but I've heard. But anyway, and so here he is. He's between this rock and this hard place. And he's wondering, God... You made a promise to me. You made a promise. And here I am. I'm not living in the promise. Maybe you felt that way before. You're like, this is so far from the promise. This is so far from being king. I'm a, cra I'm, I'm a crazy person now, you know. And I'm, I'm fleeing from my life. I'm a criminal. I'm not, I'm not living the king life. 
And this is where Psalm 56, verse 9 through 10, David writes these words in this psalm. And here's, basically this is what he says. There's so many things I don't, I don't know right now. There's so many questions that I can't answer. There's so many details that are not going my way. This is basically what he's saying. And he says, but in, in Psalm 56, 9 through 10, he says, this one thing I do know, God is for me. I might be, right, be living between a rock and a hard place. I might be in a situation that is, is not the promise that, that, that I was given on that day when I was anointed king of Israel. But this one thing I do know for sure, that God is for me. The enemies are coming against me. They're coming after me. I don't know what to do. Seems like I've taken three steps back, one step forward. I'm scared to death. I don't know what's supposed to happen next. Maybe you felt that way. But this one thing I know beyond anything else, God is for me. And he says this. He says, I'm trusting God. Oh, praise his promises. I'm not afraid of anything mere man can do to me. Yes, praise his promises. Because this one thing I know, God is for me. Some of you, God's going to give you a promise today. And you're going to hang on to it. And you're going you're gonna to receive strength from it. You're going to receive nourishment from it. You're gonna, it's going gonna, it's gonna to strengthen you when you're weak. It's going to hold you up. He already gave me a promise this morning. And maybe that's your one thing this morning. Maybe it's a promise. There are a lot of promises, but I just picked a few. I'm going to read them. Here's what God promises. God promises in his word to meet every need you have from his glorious riches. If you're hurting financially, you're afraid, God promises that he'll meet every need that you have. He promises that you won't be tempted beyond what you can bear. So those of you who continue to go back into these repetitive sins, guess what? There's a way out. There's power through Christ to help you to overcome that temptation, that sin, that sin that's gripped you. There is a way out. God promises to forgive all of our sins. If you're hurting this morning, if you're under the weight of the past, and you, you maybe have these thoughts, I did it, I'm ashamed of it. I feel the guilt of it. Guess what? It's forgiven. God will cast it into the sea of forgetfulness, and he'll remember it no more. That's his promise. God promises to make everything, even the bad things, especially the bad things. God promises to make everything work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God promises if you feel alone or abandoned, that he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll be with you forever. God promises to be an ever-present help in trouble. He promises to give strength to the weary. He's your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. He promises to guide you, to give you direction. Many of you don't know what to do next. You don't know where to turn. God will guide you. He is the good shepherd. You are his sheep. The sheep recognize his voice. It's the shepherd's role to, to lead the sheep. And he's going to lead you. He's going to lead you into green pastures. If you follow his promises. He promises to give you a peace that goes beyond our ability to understand. God promises to give you power to defeat, to defeat Satan. To overcome the work of the evil one. You resist him, he will flee from you. God promises that nothing will separate you from his love. He promises that you are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. And for those of you who are not walking with Christ this morning, you're not in a relationship with him, God promises you eternal life through his son Jesus. There are some things I don't understand. There's some things I don't, I don't get. But I do understand this, that God is for me. He is with me. What is that one thing you desire from God this morning? What is, what is that one thing that you lack? 
What is that one thing that you need to let go of? What's that promise, that one promise that you need to grab a hold of and you need to claim for your life? Forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. For God is a good God. He's with you now. And he's doing a new thing. Amen? See, I don't want, to just, I don't want just good intentions. I don't want to just have good intentions. I want to have a God intention. I want my heart to be open. And my life to be open to that one thing that God wants to do this year in my life. If you'd take that card, and on the side where it says, my one, we're going to pray in just a moment, and the, our worship team's going to come up, and we're going to begin to worship the Lord together, and as we be, they begin to sing and lead us in worship, as we pray, I want you to just open your heart. Maybe the Lord has already dropped something in your heart, and it's just, you know, it's, it's in your mind, it's in your heart, something that's already there, and you just say, that's it, that's my one thing. As you write that one thing, don't write two things, three things, just one thing, just one. As you write that one thing, when you're done, would you join us in worshiping the Lord this morning? As we focus on that one thing, and over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about the power of one. Can we do that? Forget the former things, says the Lord. Do not dwell on the past. Let go. Let go. See, I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. He's doing a new thing. I want you to take that card. Put it somewhere safe. Put it somewhere where you're going to remember it. I guess we used to put them in our Bibles, but now that we have our Bible on our phone, kind of a little difficult, you know, stick it in your wallet, your purse. And over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about the power of one. But the one thing, as we go into this new year, God, this, this is the one thing, this is the one promise, this is the one thing I want to let go of, this is the one thing that I lack, this is the one thing that I desire from you. This is the one thing I desire for you to do in me we do that together father thank you thank you for your presence god not only do you promise us that you're with us but you really are we feel you we sense you we, god we know it and we're so grateful for it we're so grateful for what you've done in our lives and we look forward to this new year with excitement about what you're going to do how we're going to know you in a deeper way. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great, great week, a great New Year's, and bring somebody to life. Because your name is high.